Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. What does Darth Vader say next? Luke, I am your father? Well, let's see. No, I am your father. That might be a subtle difference, but it's an example many people use when talking about the supposed Mandela effect. The Mandela effect is a sort of collective false memory. It's a phenomenon described as a large group of people remembering an event or thing that is different from reality. Streets like these are usually brought up when promoting a more European style of development and city design. Streets like these are usually much more dense and lively than the towns and cities most Americans live in. These streets have shops, homes, parks, and people all intertwined. You can find what you're looking for or go where you need to be without a car. When Americans hear arguments as to why some cities in Europe are like this, they likely say, think, or hear the following statement. Well, the US was built for cars. Or, those places over there are so much older, they weren't built for cars. This is the Mandela effect for urbanism and cities. The truth is, most cities in the US have, or well better put, had, an origin as pedestrian-focused centers. Most urban cores in the US are built around a previously present density that promoted and thrived on walking and collective transportation. However, almost all of these city centers have been encapsulated by highways and their density replaced by parking lots, leading to most Americans unfortunately believing that this is just the way it's always been, and the country was simply built around cars. Miami is no different. Miami and Florida saw its growth start thanks to railroads, streetcars, and mixed densities. Like most U.S. cities, this has long been forgotten, and the great majority of the city and region are now car dependent. But Miami has the Metro Mover. This unique transit system can hopefully help it promote a more balanced approach to urban living, and it just might be the future of Miami's transport. South Florida has been growing in population a lot. The entire metropolitan area has grown by 2 million people over the last 30 years. And it's going to keep on growing. Miami as a city covers a small section of the overall metro area. It's seen a growth of around 100,000 people. South Florida's urban planning has revolved almost exclusively around single-family homes and car-centric development. The vast majority of people depend on cars. And over the last 30 years, there's been little effort to change this. But there are exceptions, the biggest being Miami. And the Metro Mover helps Miami be that exception. Miami has one of the country's most particular transit systems. Along with Jacksonville, Detroit, and Morgantown, Miami has an automated people mover. This system is driverless and elevated, and it's based around small cars that carry a few dozen people. Unlike the other cities that adopted this technology, Miami's is the closest to success. Before the pandemic, it was seeing over 30,000 riders per day. The Metro Mover has helped neighborhoods become more accessible. Having a system in place that is not hampered by on-street traffic, like many of the current bus lines in Miami, makes it a more reliable option for transit. The Metro Mover is a visible alternative to car-centric development. And it recalls a past when Miami was first growing, where multiple forms of transportation were present in the city and the region. For a few decades, Miami's growth was helped by its streetcar system. And, compared to the current forms of alternatives to car transportation, the streetcar covered the downtown urban core, Coral Gables, Miami Beach, and beyond. For a lot of different reasons, the development style of Miami and the entire country moved almost exclusively towards urban sprawl dependent on the car. What happens when you don't present these populated areas with alternatives to driving? Miami's daily traffic. Presenting viable alternatives to the typical suburban model is a necessity 
especially because the region is seeing growth. Not just because creating vibrant pedestrian neighborhoods gives the city more robustness economically, but also because transitioning to a more sustainable culture means decreasing our reliance on cars. People's eagerness to use alternatives is seen in South Florida through the success of the Bright Line. The Bright Line is a privately owned and operated intercity rail that began services in 2018. It's the first passenger rail on Florida's East Coast Railway in over 40 years, and its keystone is Miami Central. Rebuilding a passenger rail hub in downtown Miami has spurred hundreds of millions of dollars in development, and it has the potential to be a catalyst for transit-oriented development throughout the rail corridor. Over 1 million people rode the system in 2022, and the numbers continue to rise. Brightland has plans to open more stations alongside the original three. Two of these new stations have already opened, one in Aventura and another one in Boca Raton. There's also plans to open a commuter rail service. Alongside existing stations, the commuter rail system would potentially include five new stations in Miami-Dade and potentially more stations in Broward and West Palm Beach. These new stations would be in some of the more denser areas of South Florida, and they could spur further transit-oriented development along the corridor. South Florida also has an older commuter rail system. The Tri-Rail sits on a different rail line and it serves 18 stations. The Tri-Rail is probably going to see a rise in riders thanks to the long-awaited fork to downtown. Now, to complement this expansion in these rail system, Miami should probably expand the Metro Mover, right? Well, that's the plan. There's been a lot of expansions announced or proposed or studied in the past. Even recently, a connection of downtown to Miami Beach was going to be a monorail. What's in the works now is an extension of the system north by around two miles, from the current last station at the school board all the way to the design district. The northern extension is planned to run on North Miami Avenue and serve neighborhoods like Overtown, Wynwood, and Midtown. These are areas that are seeing huge growth and density. Wynwood serves as one of the major shopping and entertainment districts in the area, so providing alternatives and transportation for residents and visitors is long overdue. Combining the planned commuter rail expansion with the Metro Mover expansion is great on paper, so let's hope this doesn't get forgotten like so many other infrastructure projects in Miami. This is where the last stop of the Metro Mover is planned to be. This street is not friendly for pedestrians or cyclists. It has high-speed traffic and narrow sidewalks. But just on the opposite side of the design district, 2nd Avenue is much more welcoming. Along with actually building the extension, the plan is to redesign North Miami Avenue to be more inclusive. If all is said and done, it should look more like this than how it is now. The design district has the type of walkable urbanism that should not be exclusive to a luxury enclave. Building these types of neighborhoods can be adopted more broadly and expansions in the metro mover, commuter rail, bus systems, and bike lanes can help bring about that. As the name suggests, the beach corridor will finally connect Miami to Miami Beach. Someone living or coming to Brickell, downtown, Midtown, Woodwood, or Edgewater will be connected to the beach. Of course, this is huge for the residents of the area and those nearby that can take other forms of transport and be in reach of a station quickly. But it's also huge for the millions of tourists coming to the city every year. The plan is to add a station before the causeway next to downtown and then two stations on 5th Street in Miami Beach. This could be a great opportunity to redesign 5th Street. This is what 5th Street currently looks like. High-speed traffic, little cycling infrastructure, and an overall unpleasant experience both for pedestrians and drivers. During rush hour and on weekends, the MacArthur and further north the Julia Tuttle get packed. The solution to this in the past has been extremely car-centric. And even now, there's proposals to alleviate the traffic mess by adding more lanes. Going forward, FDOT, local and state leaders 
could continue with the same design and transportation practices as before. Road widening, highways, more lanes, and a minuscule dedication to different options. But like the design district and other small pockets of urbanism throughout the region, Miami Beach is an exception to the car-centric dominance in thinking and planning. Miami Beach has mixed density, sensible distances for pedestrians and cyclists, and the opportunity to improve and set a standard. Miami needs more transit options, and delivering on the Metro Mover could be step one. Continuing the same trend of the last 60 years, and just expanding into the Everglades with single-family homes and strip malls will just add pollution and traffic to the already congested streets and highways. There's been proposal after proposal to expand the Metro Mover and Metro Rail, but voters have been disappointed and deceived for a long time. Hopefully this time, local leaders will deliver.